Hello, and thank you for joining me today for Breaking News with Media Leaders. I'm your host, Keontae Coleman, and we have a great guest with us today. You may remember this guest. Had some technical difficulties the last time, but Dr. Judy Ascom has so graciously uh, come back to make sure that we could hear everything that she said. So, Dr. Oscar, thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, we have worked through the audio trolls, and hopefully we'll be able to get through this interview with no issues. We hope so. And again, those of us that have been in television and media, we know how that works. So we'll give it a go, Chianti. Thanks for having me back. Thank you. So I want to start off the show with allowing you to situate yourself for the audience. Tell us how you got into the field of journalism and how that's led you to leading the program at Texas State University. Well, I'm happy to share. I never thought I'd be in this position. I, I went to uh, the University of North Texas. It was North Texas State University back then. And uh, first of all, I'll say I grew up watching the Mary Tyler Moore show. So that kind of dates me. But I saw a young professional woman in television and that sparked an interest. Fast forward, I went to North Texas and my roommate was doing a radio show. Jenny uh, Harris. And Jenny said, well, why don't you come do the radio show with me? I didn't even know you could major in radio, TV, film. So I ended up majoring in radio, TV, film. I got out and my first job was in television. I ended up working in television and markets in Oklahoma and Texas for a while uh, before I decided to uh, get into public relations. Uh, when I was in Austin. So I worked in Ardmore, Oklahoma, Amarillo, and then Austin, Texas, and television. And then I went to work for the University of Texas system at, in public relations or governmental relations. And from there, I had an opportunity to go back to Oklahoma State and run a video grant project for NIOSH. And while I was there, I thought, maybe I should go to grad school. So I looked at going to grad school. I had four years on my grant and I decided to jump in and work on my master's and my doctorate in higher ed while I was running this video project. Uh, so from there, I ended up, um, I looked around at Oklahoma State. I was in the Department of Biosystems and Ag Engineering and I looked around at the professors and I saw how exciting their career was mentoring students, working on research and being on the university campus. And I thought, how do I get there? So I jumped into the doctoral program and then my first teaching job was at Texas Tech University. Great university and I had the honor of working there for 12 years before I went to uh, Texas State University in 2006, I wanted to get closer to my family in San Antonio. And then, so I was a professor, I taught public relations, electronic media, um, mass communication courses, and then took over as the director in 2012. And I'm honored to lead a great group of faculty and staff. And we have a large program, we're over 2000 majors and we're one of the largest uh, mass comm programs in, in the country. So I, I never thought I would be here from watching the Mary Tyler Moore show back in the day to going to, I was a recreational sports my, major, and then I realized you could major in this field. So it was just a really interesting path. I love hearing those stories because I think it just shows that one, when we have inspiration, you know, uh, it, it can it can do something for you. Uh, I have something a little similar where I grew up in a household that watched the news religiously, and that was the time when Bryant Gumble was on the Today Show, and my grandfather would call me Bryant Gumble all the time because I talked too much. <laughs> I was always running around asking questions. So I, I've been 
intrigued by the news since I was little. Uh, so it, it's kind of weird how that can uh, manifest itself sometimes. Well, and it shows you representation matters. It matters when you see someone like yourself in the media. It's, you know, it does matter. It does uh, have an influence on us. So I'm yeah. very aware of that. Very aware of that. Yeah. I want you to, you told us that you're the director of a large journalism mass communications program, JMC for short in our uh, world. Uh, tell me a little bit about that role. What does that mean to you? If somebody were looking to become a director, what would they have in store? I think uh, the key is I I'm really lucky that I work with some real top class faculty. And I think that's, that's really key. But we've also, as a team, we've been very purposeful about hiring the right people. So I think an understanding of, to me, my role as, as the director or the chairman or whatever your role is, you really go, as a faculty member, you, you really have to worry about your own research and your own teaching. And you're, you're, you're worried about me. In this job, you go from me to we. So the issue becomes, I feel like my role is to do as much as I can to support my faculty. And if I've, if we as a team have hired the right people, which we have at Texas State, then the goal is to help them advance their careers. If I can do whatever I can to build them up and empower them, provide the resources, provide the space, provide the opportunities for them to excel, I think that's my role. Um, and I think you do have to go as a leader, you have to go from me to we really quickly. And that's a different mind shift because as a faculty member, you're always promoting your own research because that's the nature. You're sort of a free agent when you're a faculty member. And yes, you're a member of a team, but you stand on your own integrity and your own um, accomplishments. As a unit leader, your goal is to, uh, if you look at good to great and a lot of the teachings in that, you've got to make sure everyone is on the right bus, in the right seat, going the right direction. So I think I, think I really enjoy working with a faculty member to find out where do you want to go next? How can I help you get there? What do you need in order to be successful? Because if they're successful, it all goes back to the students. And that's the bottom line. If everything we ask, everything we try and accomplish benefits the students, we're doing the right thing. So that's sort of my mindset with that. I like that. Can you to dive into it a little more because that's a little more of the philosophy of that position. Can you go into kind of some of the nuts and bolts? What does a week look like for you? Well, that's a good question. Um, sometimes I drive home at night and think, what did I accomplish? <laughs> what did I do today? So it might be you're working with workload issues with the administration. It might be working with uh, our policies needing to be updated. You're working with other chairs and directors on certain issues. Um, you're you're uh, working on hiring paperwork. Uh, so there, there's a lot of paperwork and processing. That's not the fun stuff, but that is the important thing that you have to do. Um, Texas State is, we are getting a merit bonus, a 3% merit bonus in the fall. The university, we're all hoping that becomes a permanent increase and a raise. So we're working on merit justifications right now. So it's a lot of, uh, again, clearing the path, doing the little details so the faculty don't have to really deal with that. Um, yes, we involve personnel committee in, in a lot of those decisions. When we do hiring, of course, there's a hiring committee and a search committee. Uh, but a lot of it is the Monday. It's not the fun stuff, but mm -hmm. 
but it is it it is the um, it helps keep the bus on track so that everyone can keep moving forward. Uh, it's working with uh, faculty who are going up for tenure in the fall. Uh, we have practice rank faculty who will be going up for promotion. So it's a lot of finding the external reviewers for them, working with them to get their list of suggested external reviewers. And it's a lot of back and forth on that. Uh, accreditation, we just went through our accreditation successfully. So it's some follow up to that. Okay, we've just passed on all eight standards. What are we going to do next? Uh, strategic planning, you know, we're doing some things along those lines. Okay. Thank you. I, yeah, I think those, um, those types of things. Right. And it, and it's good to understand if you're pursuing that role, what are some of those things that you should be looking out for? Do you, um, in your role as director, do you play any part in fundraising? And if so, what does that look like from the director position? Uh, in our at our university, we we do some, and of course, if people are giving us money, that they're not going to turn it away. The dean is our chief fundraiser. We're in the College of Fine Arts and Communication, and so we we are part of that team. But we do have someone assigned from development to our uh, area, and so we work with her. Uh, scholarship donations. Uh, there is a lot of back and forth between the donors. We do have an advisory council that we work with for the School of Journalism and Mass Communication. And that's an area that I hope to enhance now that we're through the pandemic and do more on-campus meetings and get our alums better connected. So that's always an area that we can improve on. Our Bobcats out there are just doing great, exciting things. So we, and they always are so good to give back to the university. So yes, that is an area that I want to to grow a little bit. Okay, I I know from our last conversation, this is going to be a lot of helpful information. Um, so I want to switch gears a little bit because this show is about helping students and professionals get to kind of that next step. Let's start with those high school students that are coming into college and now they're first, maybe even second year students, and they're still trying to figure out their way. If they want to really figure out what to do and go down this uh, journalism, media, mass communications area and really figure out where do I fit in, what's your advice to them? I would suggest that they look in their own hometown, and if they're in high school now, get involved with their high school media and their yearbook uh, operation. Um, a lot of high schools have a, have a great opportunity there that they can – do the yearbook, they can cover stories. There might be a radio or TV news broadcast they can get involved with. Just start writing, uh, start a blog, work with your teachers to help you find that path. Uh, and look in your local area. If you have a local radio station, TV station, newspaper, go visit, connect with someone and get behind the scenes. You could probably even get an internship there or get a job there. So I would say start while you're a student because media professionals are so welcoming to students and they always want to see someone uh, involved in that learning process. So I would say get involved. I like that. One thing, one thing that I tell my students is use the fact that you're a student now yes. because as soon as you graduate no one's taking kindly to a stranger walking off the street saying can i walk into your place of employment that's right and then your competition right <laughs> right <laughs> students kind of get a free pass and college students do too 
Yeah. So since we we kind of talked about the early folks, let's get involved, that type of thing. What about our juniors and seniors who are close to getting out? What's the advice for them to make sure that they are really ready to hit the ground running once they graduate? Yeah, uh, I would say we always have students get involved in the student organizations, whether it's PRSSA, whether it's our, our you know, competitive insect team, uh, whether it's our student newspaper, the University Star, KTSW Radio, we tell students get involved as much as they can and connect and do internships as well. Our most successful students have done one, two, sometimes three internships before they graduate. And so in, they don't have to be a whole semester long. They can be part of a semester and they can be unpaid and not for credit too. So students can do internships for credit or not for credit. Um, internships are key in connecting with alums. I suggest, and I build this into my capstone class, create a LinkedIn profile and make contacts with uh, alumni and connect with alumni that you want to, in the field you want to work in. So take advantage of that Bobcat network in our case, that alumni network and worry. And also, I also warn them, consider your own brand. What does your own social media look like? You're going to be looked at now. If you're starting to apply for jobs, people will go back and look at your social. So make sure your social is what you want it to be and you're projecting the image that you want in the workforce moving forward. I think that's really sound advice. Um, okay, so we got them out. We got them yeah. in the door. They're working. Now they're early career professionals, one, two, three years into the field. This isn't quite what I was thinking it was going to be, Dr. Oscar. I, 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 I'm, I'm kind of far away from home or I'm in this smaller market than I thought. What's your advice to either keep them motivated or possibly even pivot if you're hearing something, you know, almost toxic maybe uh, for them? I would say do connect back with us. And I told a couple of students that I really had a good relationship with this last spring, hey, you did a great project. Keep me in mind, reach out to me if I can ever be of help to you. Faculty love to help students advance in their career. And especially the good ones that, are, that get jobs in the field because a lot of our students decide to go in different directions, which that's the beauty of a career in media or communication. You can work in a lot of different areas. But I, I would tell them, reach out back to us and Check, with, check in with us. Um, I have students that I still talk with that I had 20 years ago at Texas Tech. And some of them have had some career pivots. And we've talked about it. We've gotten on the phone and had a conversation. Um, it, we've all been there. And why not share and learn from each other? Because we learn, too, as faculty, we learn what's going on in the workplace as well when, when they come back and talk with us. And then what I think faculty can do is we can maybe connect that student with another alum or another contact to help them make that transition and pivot. And they, I think when students get out, they really do realize the benefit of networking. I really am a strong um, proponent of networking and not because to get something from it, to me, it's about building relationships. I might be able to provide a resource for you. You might be able to help me with one of my students. So again, it's about building relationships. Our career, it can be very long. So why not have some really key advisors in your corner? And I like to tell students, build your own personal advisory board. 
Think about who is going to be in your corner. Your parents, of course, maybe, maybe a relative, maybe a former professor, a pastor, who might be someone you could pick up the phone and call. Now you need to pick up the phone and call or email. So again, don't be afraid to make that connection. We're, we're here to help you. And I think throughout a long career, we're, we're here for life. That's the way I think of it. I, I appreciate that sentiment because it's one that I know a lot of professors and folks on this end of things, that's how we feel, you know? So don't be shy about reaching back out. I, I completely agree with that. So you can, Yeah, and same. I think that's part of the deal. I think we've got to do that. But I have a relationship with these people. So, you know. Yeah, I, I completely agree. So you kind of touched on this. But advice for faculty, mid-career professionals who are possibly thinking about going into leadership positions, uh, management positions, something where, okay, I've been doing this, I feel like I've mastered this area. What about getting into that seat? What was some things that you would suggest that they start to do now in the positions that they're in and things to think about? I think it's real important to, to consider both ends of that. Uh, the fact that you really have to manage up and manage down. Um, I couldn't do a lot of what I do without a great dean right across the hall. And I'm in the hundred year old building in Old Maiden right now. But I couldn't do a lot of what I do without his support. And so understanding that my relationship with him, I want to help him look good, uh, but I want the college to succeed. So working with managing up and managing down is really important. And um, there is such a thing as currency. So I'm careful about, I ask for things that I really think the unit needs. Uh, I don't want to burn my currency with someone else or my social capital on something that uh, I, I really want to make sure that that's a win that I really want to fight for. Um, because I know in the, at the college level and the university level, they're at 30,000 feet. They're have a, they have multiple units and faculty to deal with and problems and issues. So I think understanding that relationship is key. The other thing I will say, and, and this is something you and I've talked about before, is um, I think it's important to know your strengths, your personal strengths as a leader, and not that I am perfect by any means, but I do know what I'm better at. And I know what I don't enjoy as much. So I think understanding your natural strengths really can help you succeed about building the right team around you. Um, I just finished um, participating with our School of Social Work uh, here at Texas State on a, a Leadership Academy training and I did the strengths uh, assessments and I worked with the, the leadership team in the School of Social Work. And I think it was um, very helpful and enlightening for those faculty to understand that, and one of them wrote this in one of the assessments was, I realized, you know, this, this person said, I realized that leaders come in all shapes, sizes, and skill sets. And that was so valuable because she really did understand, oh, I can be a leader. Here's how I need to use my natural talents within this team. So I think that's important to do. I've done quite a bit of strengths uh, training with my own faculty. If they want to do it, it's all voluntary because since I'm here, I, I don't really feel like I want to force that onto my faculty but it is an option. And I think some of my faculty, I think have really 
uh, welcome to that. And they've seen some traction there, if you will. I, I can appreciate that. And I would like to, since you teed it up perfectly there, to have a conversation about my strengths. Uh, I did the Clifton Strengths uh, survey earlier this uh, year, academic year, because I participated in our campus um, leadership program. And I shared that with you and you helped me unlock a couple of more of those. So uh, could you explain what the Clifton Strength Strength Finder uh, survey is to the audience, and then we can talk about what uh, what, what you see in in my results there. Yes, well, the the Clifton Strengths, and it's named after Don Clifton, who said, "Wouldn't it be nice to find out what was working and what was right with people than what was wrong?" It's a positive approach to leadership and development, and. Uh, you know, Keontae did, you know, we, we unlocked your manager's report, but the Clifton Strengths assessment is based on 50 plus years of research. And it really identifies a set of uh, 34 talent themes that uh, are in order of how they, how they come to fruition in your own life. It's not that you don't have talents in certain areas, it's just that some are more, um, uh, are your top and some are your you don't enjoy as much and I'll kind of go through some of yours uh, and this is from the Clifton Strengths for Managers report which I think is very important if you're a leader your top 10 and I'll just run these down and then I'll give you a little bit of on your top five individualization responsibility learner analytical achiever competition futuristic, positivity, self-assurance, and arranger. And let me tell you just about your top five and see how these ring true. Individualization, my daughter has this in her top five. You really see the uniqueness of every individual. You really realize how special they are and how different people can be, and you, you value that. Uh, responsibility, you and I have this, and this is where we say we're going to do something, we're going to do it. <laughs> People can depend on us, um, but with each of these talents, and I'll say this up front, there is what I call a superpower and an edge. Now, the superpower of responsibility is we're going to get it done. People can give us a task and, or an assignment, we'll get it done. The edge of this is that we might be up at three in the morning getting it done. So we need to be careful about <laughs> saying yes. And I'll talk about some, some behavior design issues in just a minute, but learner, a lot of faculty are learners, natural learners. We enjoy the process of learning. I think this is my number six talent. So I have this in my top 10 as well. So you enjoy the process of learning. Uh, the edge of that might be that you think you need to take one more class before you take action or mm. you need to read one, one more book. I say jump in and I'm trying to do this myself as well. Uh, analytical. I always want someone with analytical on the team or the project because you can really dive into the details and make sure we don't miss something. So that's a, that's a great talent to have. Achiever, you're always thinking of leveling up. What's next? How do we make whatever it is better, whether it's a class project or a, a podcast, you know, like this, how can we improve this? Competition, just what it sounds, but you're probably pretty competitive uh, with yourself too. Mm -hmm. So that's something to be aware of. It's not, it's not necessarily a negative that, oh, he's always competing. You're constantly challenging yourself on what's next. And that's, that's evident because of your career. So you keep moving forward. Futuristic, I have this in my top five. We can see around the corner. We can, we can see what's coming next. Uh, the challenge that we have is we need to explain to others who don't have futuristic, why are we thinking that way? I had to tell my husband, I kept saying, what are we doing in five years? And he 
does not, he's a live for the moment kind of a guy. So it helped him to see, oh, this is why Judy's always saying, what are we doing in five years? What are we doing in 10 years? I think it helped our marriage. So um, that's an interesting one. Yeah. yeah, You have to be aware of that because you're so busy in the future. You, for me, and it's higher on for me, I'm so far, I, I don't enjoy the tasks that are today, like that paperwork I mentioned. Um, positivity is another, just what it sounds like. So you, you are see the glass half full instead of half empty. It's a very good, my 91 year old mother, that's her number one talent. And I see her, I keep saying, mom, we are making it through a global pandemic. You know, you've got positivity. <laughs> So she's great. And self-assurance, uh, you, you feel, uh, you, you know, you know who you are, you know what you're coming into the situation with, you know what you could bring. Uh, that's, that's a great talent to have. Um, people can depend on that. And then a ranger, you, you can deal with a lot of different balls in the air. It's not a problem for you to do that. Um, now I'll say with these, each of these, you can kind of dial them up and dial them down as you need them. Think of them as audio, dial them up, dial them down. And then you can be proactive about some of these as well. Um, you can also think about, Gallup always says, uh, talent. So you have the natural talent. If you spend time in the talent, it becomes a strength. So the more you really... Uh, work on a certain area, futuristic, let's say, the better you will get at predicting or looking around the corner and then do gotcha. with it, you know? So that's sort of a thumbnail sketch, but I think you, you're you in the right place and definitely in the leadership zone uh, for what you're doing right now and what you're going to do at Syracuse, right? Yeah, I, I definitely appreciate that. Yeah, I it's it's helpful to i think do these types of uh surveys every now and again to see kind of where you are if life has maybe shifted some things or uh if you've kind of stayed steady and grown those uh strengths even more so i definitely appreciate you sharing that sure exactly and and i think occasionally meeting with a coach or someone who can work through a certain issue. I know I talked with someone this last semester who a woman just got tenure and she said, well, what do I do now? I, I don't really know what, what I'm supposed to be doing now. So we dove back into her strengths and then we tied on some behavior design and we looked at, okay, because you know, you know, you can change your life by changing behaviors. So then I like to layer on, behavior design with that. And I use the tiny habits and you know, BJ Fogg is the expert at Stanford. And so it's a matter of kind of melding those two together, I think really can be helpful. So I think it got her sort of unstuck, which I think we all need that sometimes. Can you talk a little more about the tiny habits? I know you're certified in, in that as well. Yeah. Well, and, and that's, I've, I've, got into that during the pandemic. I thought there, I need some way to then help people apply their strengths in a real hands-on real way. So they get some traction and you do change your life by changing behavior and behavior design, according to BJ Fogg, and he's the Stanford researcher who you know, developed the uh, behavior design lab at Stanford. Um, Behavior design is a series of models and methods and BJ Fogg's behavior design model, the Fogg behavior model is really the key to me for how to transform on this. It's, it's a simple formula. It's B equals M A P. So behavior happens when motivation and ability and prompt converge at the same moment. So again, it's helping understand, for example, let's take, uh, let's take responsibility, for example. So you and I both have that. So uh, the, the formula is you, you would design then a tiny, if you will, a tiny habits recipe and the anatomy of this recipe is, is uh, ABC, 
there's an anchor moment uh, and that's you tie something to an existing routine. Uh, the B is the new behavior that you want to keep super tiny. And then the C is the instant celebration. So to give you an example, uh, you and I both have responsibility. So after we are given a new assignment or asked to take on assignment, a new assignment, we will say, I will check my calendar and get back with you. And then, you know, we will we put a pause, we put some space in between, but if it, that will help us because we will say yes, because we know we can do it. <laughs> and then we'll be stuck working at three in the morning again or something. So again, there are ways to build in little habits. Uh, you can, it all depends on what you want to accomplish. If you want to do more fitness in your life, you can build in tiny habits there. It's like, if, if you think about it, when, when we're teaching, when our child is learning how to walk, they don't get up and run a marathon. They take step by step by step. And then what do we do when they take that first step? Great job. Great job. We celebrate. Now, the celebration was the hardest part for me because I'm not a natural celebrator, but I realized that if I can just celebrate that one small step, and um, I think that's important. Like every night, one, one of my habits is to write down two wins for the day. This will be one of my wins. Getting through this interview with you, <laughs> it's such a fun time, is one of my wins already. So I'm going to write down the, that win. And that's just a habit that I have at the end of my day. It's sort of a gratitude habit. But it's built on an existing routine. After I go to my nightstand, I will write my two wins. So again, it's just bit, that's my anchor is when I go to my nightstand. Okay. So I build it into some things that I already do, but it's super successful because it's not based on motivation. It's based on the ABC method, the anchor. So anyway, that's more than you wanted to know, but no, that is so helpful. And it, it especially the example you use because the these i have a quick trigger yes and then i have a phone filled with due date due date due date due date because i didn't step back and say can i really do this in this amount of time yes because yeah. when you say yes to that you're saying no to something else exactly understand that and again i'm preaching to the choir here because i need this too but uh it's just been a real and you know the bj fog team and you know, the tiny habits academy is such a great group of coaches uh and you know bj offers a free five-day program if anybody wants to do it i run my students through it if they as part of my class and then they come out of there with some some habits and again what do, what do we really judge people on? It's their behavior. So if we can change behavior, that's the whole, that's the whole goal. And at the university level too, I think it really does help students. I like that. Yeah. I, I, I definitely have to dive into that because, um, I, I appreciate what you're saying and honestly, the simplicity of it. Mm -hmm. I think it helps our graduating seniors. Like one of one of my suggestions for the LinkedIn after for the students after you you open LinkedIn, make one copy, just one copy, and so keep it so simple, and uh, and that gets you going. So that every time you log into LinkedIn, you're going to make one copy, and it's easy to do for students. They have to really think about who should that contact be, but it's just, tr I'm trying to get them more engaged. Uh, I like that. Right. Yeah. I, I may be taking that one with me. I, I like that. All right. It's fun. 
And again, emotions create habits. So again, if we feel good about it, we're going to do it again. That's the key. I can appreciate that. Yes, yes, yes. One thing that I ask all of my guests is to share some breaking news with us. This is Breaking News with Media Leaders. So, Dr. Oskam, break some news for us. What's going on? Well, I would say one thing that I don't know how new news it is, but we, we are recently reaccredited by ACEJMC. So I'm excited about that. Again, kudos to our great team of faculty and staff and students um, who got us through a rough two years of the pandemic. So, again, we do a lot of online already. We are, we are looking at uh, jumping into our strategic plan come fall. So that's my professional breaking news. Personally, I'm working on a new online class with the Tiny Habits Academy about um, academic success, Tiny Habits and academic success. So I'm hoping I have that course finished by fall. So I'm going to do some piloting of that hopefully in the fall and test that out. But I guess that would be my breaking news uh, and just excited to be with you and see what a great program this is building out to be. I just can't wait to see what guests you have on next, Keontae. It's going to be fun. Thank you so much. And congratulations on the reaccreditation because that's no small feat in any time at any time. But during <laughs> COVID, <laughs> so congratulations on that. And uh, for the Tiny Habits course, that, that sounds wonderful. It's going to be fun. It's going to be a lot of fun. What is, I like to get uh, each of the leaders to talk about their thoughts on the future of the industry. And since you kind of tow a couple of different industries, why don't you give me JMC education and then just kind of innovation going forward in the, in the media landscape and otherwise, because I know you're kind of all over the place with uh, innovation. Well, I think, I think innovation is key, and I'm lucky that our faculty are really at the forefront of, of, of innovation. Um, I think faculty of the future need to really, in our area, need to have a good handle on digital skills, strategic vision. They have to understand the market, but they also have to understand how to pivot and how to help students um, make those transitions as well throughout their career. So I think understanding how the workplace is changing with hybrid remote uh, media content is cha has changed. Uh, how we're consuming our media all the time is changing. So I think our faculty are definitely on the cutting edge, and I know a lot of JMC faculty across the country are thinking of those issues and then where, where we are going next. Um, from a student perspective, understanding that the path is not one path anymore. And a degree in our field really gives you the skill set in a lot of different arenas. Um, my own daughter has a communication degree. It's more of a comm study degree. She's working for an NFT gallery right now and doing social media for a, for a company. So again, and she's working part remote, part here, part there, part event oriented. My youngest daughter is still at the university and she's doing a lot on social media and TikTok and making money. So to be entrepreneurial and to have that mindset is going to be, I think, more important moving forward. But I really think our faculty can help the students uh, unravel that. If, if the students will 
keep an open mind and really think about um, being as creative, but realizing it's up to them to chart their own path. And I always tell students, you really have to start. If you, the earlier you start, the more you start building those connections and those connections can help you get to the next level, wherever you're trying to go. So again, take a risk, uh, continue learning, have a growth mindset and, and all of those uh, characteristics are good for faculty and for students, I think. Again, phenomenal information, great advice. Thank you so much for doing this with me again. Well, thank you, and I hope, <laughs> hope the audio worked, but if it didn't, we'll try it again and see what happens. But if anybody has any questions, feel free to reach out, contact me. I'm happy to connect with you and and share resources with you or get some feedback from you because I'm always trying to build my network too because, again, we're all learning and growing together. That's really true. Sounds wonderful. And I forgot to bring it up. You have a podcast. You want to share a little bit of information about that? I have a podcast, and Keontae, I'm going to get you on the podcast. And it's just a hobby podcast right now, but I had to do something creative, and I thought uh, I'm always interested in stories from people I meet all over the place. So it's called Stories of Change and Creativity. And I tend to focus more on entrepreneurs and business owners who are, or creatives who have um, really experienced tremendous change or how did they get past something and what's their story. I'm fascinated. When I was in TV news, I love doing the features. I love doing the features because hard news kind of writes itself, right? But the features I found I could find find an interview from from anybody. So again, if anyone has a story to share, let me know. Stories of change and creativity, and I'm on iTunes and all over the place, everywhere you'd find podcasts. So give us a listen. I love it. Thank you so much. I wish you nothing but the best going forward with you, your faculty, staff, and students at Texas State University. Thank you for joining me today. Thank you so much, Keontae. I look forward to having you on the podcast. Will do. We will definitely get that together. Thank you. Hey, everyone. Thank you so much for spending the time with us today. Once I have a new guest scheduled, you'll find out. But the way that you find out is making sure that you like and subscribe to the channel. So make sure that you hit that button. And the next time that I have a guest ready, you'll know. Have a good one.